Good evening, and it's good to see you tonight. It's good to come into the house of the Lord, to receive instruction, to be encouraged, to receive strength. Oh, how desperately we need that in our day and age. So we're here. We're going to study the Mary, the mother of Jesus. As a young Christian, Mary, as far as a woman is concerned, um, being the mother of Jesus was was one of great interest to me. I always would think of the type of woman that God would choose to do great and mighty things through. And so she was, has always been an interest, and her life continues to speak to my heart and to just stir me into greater and um, greater things and, and just walking deeper with the Lord. So I do pray that that's what, that that's what this lesson will do for us tonight as well. So with that, Turn to, you might as well just turn to Luke chapter 1, Gospel of Luke, that's in the New Testament. And with that, we'll ask God's anointing upon his word tonight. So join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for precious worship tonight. Oh, just to come and, Lord, just pour out our, our love before you through worship. What an, what an awesome thing that you've given us. And, Lord, we know that it has been acceptable in your sight. Some of us have walked in tonight just maybe a little downtrodden or a little hopeless in certain areas. And, Lord, worship just seems to lift us above the cares of this world. And, Lord, I pray that you would be the lifter of our heads tonight. Lord, so many things that are going on, not only in our personal lives, but what our nation faces. And we need you to be the lifter of our heads. Cause us to focus in on your greatness and your goodness and to remind us, as Mary's story so does, that you are in control. You are sovereign and nothing takes you by surprise. So, Father, calm us down and give us attentiveness tonight. And by your Spirit, would you cause this portion of Scripture to take root and bear much fruit in our lives? And we thank you, Jesus for the work of the cross, and all God's daughters said, Amen. Luke chapter 1. Oh, I just, I love the story. Now remember that the gospel of Luke is also known as the gospel of praise, the gospel of prayer, the gospel of childhood, and the gospel of womanhood. And through the, the teaching of this gospel, he raises woman to a place of dignity and honor and importance when she was, in fact, looked down upon as some, something of lesser value. In fact, she was scorned. Mary's story is about the kind of woman that God uses and works through. I read something around Christmas time, and I think it fits here. And it's called, Mary, Did You Know? It says, Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy came to make you new? This child that you've delivered would deliver you? Mary, did you know that your baby boy's that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? The sleeping child you were holding is the great I am. And you wonder, did she comprehend what it was that God gave her to do. I don't really comprehend all the things that the Lord gives me to do. I I don't understand the miracles. I don't understand him working through me, but I'm a testimony that it happens. And so I wonder about her. We do know that Mary, from the very beginning, was a devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. She followed him all the way through his life, Uh, all through his earthly ministry, all the way to the cross. She's one of the women that is noted to be at the cross, witnessing the entire thing. She would not leave. And then we know that she is also present at Pentecost. After Jesus arose from the dead, there she was among the 120 in the upper room waiting for the, the comforter, the promise of the Father, as she too was endued with power. And so she's mentioned quite often in Scripture Mary's story is, it is mysterious as well as miraculous. I get that. That's a good way to describe her story and what she has to say. Her story is about daily trust, 
daily dependence, and daily obedience. Thinking of obeying the Lord every day. You wake up every day and you decide, today, Lord, I am going to obey you. I'm going to walk in your commandments. I'm going to obey the things that you tell me to do. This isn't thinking about obedience tomorrow, because tomorrow is in God's hands, if tomorrow even comes. And you can't think of the obedience that you did not do yesterday or last year, because that's all covered in the blood. It's daily obedience. Today, I decide that I'm going to, I'm going to obey you, Lord. That's my choice. That's my desire. And in that, he strengthens that position, and he empowers us to indeed um, daily obedience. This story, her story, is about putting my faith in a sovereign God, knowing that he is in control of all things. He's in charge. He's in charge of our lives. He's in charge of our world, our nation. He's in charge of everything. He, he knows what's going on. That's an awesome comfort in a world that is in, in trouble or going through terrible times, in a life that is kind of chaotic. That's a good thing to know. Lord, you are in charge. You've got a reason for all of this. It speaks of surrendering all. Mary, I think, is the greatest example of surrendering all her hopes and dreams, of surrendering her life to the Lord, letting him have it all. It is about, her story is about responding in unhesitating obedience. Anything you say, Lord. And if I had a title for tonight's message... That's what I would entitle tonight's message. Anything you say, Lord, is that what you wake up with? And is that what is on your lips in the morning? Do you wake up and say, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. And anything you say, Lord, is okay with me. Just totally giving yourself to the Lord. Well, let's look at her story. We have the greeting, first of all, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and it says, starts off as we look to see what, what we can glean out of this, this story. It says, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail. Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now notice it says among women, not above women. In other words, the angel is saying you are a blessed woman. We would agree with that. Verse 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And then we pick up the story in verse 36, jumping a little bit. And behold, the angel is continuing his conversation with Mary. Gabriel is the angel's name. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her own old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. A verse that you need to tuck deep within your heart. You need to memorize it. It's not very hard. And it's something that is of great interest to each and every one of us that I really, really want to believe what the Word of God says. To underline it, to put a star by it, put a happy face, however you want to, you know, decorate it up, put a little box around it with little twirly things, whatever. But make sure that you mark this and know where it's at and tuck it deep within your heart. It is something that needs to be pondered. It's something that needs to be cultivated within our hearts. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Speaking about this miraculous birth of Um, Elizabeth in particular, and Mary's miraculous conception. We see here that a special messenger from heaven is sent to bring glad tidings of great joy. That's what he was sent to do. He's going to deliver the greatest news that the world has ever heard. We don't have good news on Channel 7, Channel 4, Channel 2, whatever channel. That, that is not good news. The angel has come to bring great, glad tidings of great joy. Tidings means good news. That's what the gospel means. It's good news. But who he has brought this great news to, this, this tidings of great joy, is to a very dark and sad world. The world was a mess. 
God had been silent for 400 years. They hadn't heard from him. The world was troubled. There was a lot of corruption, not only in the government, but also in the church. The priests were um, immoral. The people were oppressed. It was a terrible time. For us, September 11th has forever changed our lives, and our lives from that day on has not been the same. In fact, many of the joys that we once enjoyed are gone. I think of air travel and how at one time that was the greatest thing that we as Americans could do. We were free to go throughout the entire world as we wished. Air travel, in just a few hours getting to a destination. But today, the joy of flying or, or taking an airplane is not fun anymore. And anybody that has done any kind of traveling, you'll hear the same thing over and over again. Traveling isn't fun as it once used to be. The stress, the concerns, the care, the long waits, the security checks, the opening up the luggage, the delays, the anxiety that is associated with it, this joy is gone forever. Could be forever. But the joy that the angel was talking about isn't dependent upon how I feel or what my circumstances are. It has nothing to do with that. This joy that he is talking about is a joy that only Jesus can bring. It is Jesus that can bring order and beauty to my chaos, to my confusion, to my mess. Anybody in here made a mess of things lately? Are you in such a tangled upheaval that you don't even know where to begin to untangle it? That's what he's come to do. That's the joy that he brings. Let me take care of your mess, he says. What about my hassles? What about the things that just bug us? He has come to bring order and beauty to these things in our lives. Nazareth was a terrible place. The population of the city of Nazareth was about 15,000 people. It's a good-sized city. It was full of corruption Full of paganism, paganism ruled. It was a very immoral place. It was where Roman soldiers um, were stationed. It was a providence of Rome, and therefore the Roman soldiers were stationed there. They lived there. And if you know anything about Roman soldiers, the best way that we could describe them is that they were like the terrorists of today. And the atrocities that they would commit were just unspeakable. These were the residents of Nazareth. In fact, it was one of the most corrupt cities in the world at the time. And remember what was said of Nazareth? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a a terrible place. It was to this city, to a young girl named Mary. Now, Mary is between the ages of 14 and 16. She's just a teenager. Can you imagine giving this kind of a responsibility to a teenager? Oh, don't answer that. We'll just, on we go. She's a young woman, a kid. For me, that's a kid. She's from a simple home. She is not from a severely poor home. She's not really poverty-stricken, but she isn't from a wealthy home either, just a simple home. It says that she is a virgin. Now, that's significant because where she lives is a very perverse city. It is a perverse generation, a lot of immorality. And here she manages to value something that God values, and that is her virginity. She is a virgin. That says an awful lot about a teenager, 14, 15, 16 years old. Think of our society today. What are our teenage ideas for teenage girls this age? What, how do they value virginity? That says a lot. She was betrothed. And this was as binding as marriage, except that the sexual act of marriage was not um, committed. And in order to get out of a betrothal, well, you would have to be divorced. It was that binding. Mary is not a famous person. She's not well-known. She's just an ordinary woman. But she's chosen to do the extraordinary. And here she is in this city, and don't you wonder what she was doing? At the time that this angel came to her, thinking of, I always like to be a little inquisitive about things like this, and I think, well, what was she doing when the angel came? How was she living? And 
the thing was is that she was living in a place of expectancy. She was expecting God to do great and mighty things. You see, Mary believed in miracles. Mary believed in divine intervention. Mary believed this verse that we read about God is the God of the impossible. With God, all things shall be uh, possible. Or nothing shall be impossible. And I wonder sometimes, have we lost this type of faith? Do we not believe in miracles anymore? Or if we do, that happens to other people, but that doesn't happen to me. What about divine intervention? Where God works on my behalf in a divine way, in a way that is not humanly possible. And then just simply believing in the God of the impossible, that he will do the impossible for me, for you. She was waiting for Messiah. It was every Jewish girl's dream and hope and honor to be selected as the mother of the Messiah. They knew that it was going to happen. They had waited 400 years for the prophecy to come, to come true. When would it happen? So every Jewish girl would dream and hope to have the honor of being the mother of the Messiah. She was waiting for Messiah. She was in the word. This young lady knew God's word. She had a knowledge of God's word that is amazing to me, especially for her age and as young as she was. It says that she was highly favored. The angel says, Hail Mary, you are highly favored of the Lord. The Lord is with thee. That word highly favored means that she was accepted or she was in right standing with God. It has another meaning to it. It means abiding. That literally she was abiding at the side of God. And it speaks of a relationship that she had with God the Father. That's how close she was with him. So close that she walked with God that she recognized his plan for her life instantaneously. Spontaneously. There's absolutely no hesitation When the angel came and gave her the unbelievable news that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, there is no hesitation, spontaneous obedience to what God had called her to do. She recognized God's plan. Not only that, she saw the supernatural. She converses with an angel. Doesn't seem to mind, she doesn't seem to mind that at all. I I mean, it's like she's living in this place of expectancy. She is expecting God to do great and mighty things. Have we lost that vision for our lives, that God is doing little teeny tiny things? Maybe. Or is he, are you living in a place where he is, or you're expecting him to do great and mighty things? Are you not a daughter of God? Are we not the children of God? And if we are the children of God, are we not then prone to the blessings of God? Yeah. But, oh, I don't know if I have that much expectation. Yes that we would expect him to do great and mighty things. She expected that day, as any other day that she woke up, for God to do great and mighty things. And God had done great and mighty things in her life. And so she recognizes his plan, and she sees the supernatural. But notice what she see, what she, how she responds to this angel. This is so amazing to me. It says in verse 29, And when she saw him, she was troubled, At his saying, I love that word troubled. She was troubled. Now, notice she was not troubled because she saw the angel. That seems to be a expected thing. She is troubled by what he said. And she cast in her mind what manner of salutation should this be. That's just so amazing to me. What would you do if you saw an angel and he's got this message for you? Would you, you probably wouldn't even hear the message. You would be so startled because you saw the angel. Now it's the reverse with Mary. She is so tight with the Lord, walking so close to him, that this seems to be an expectation. And so she says, what might this mean? The word trouble is an interesting word. It means to de- deeply consider. It means to ponder. Mary is noted for her ability to ponder all these things, tuck it away deep within her heart, certain things that we are not allowed to disclose because these are things that God is going to take care of, that God has promised to work out. He doesn't need my help to tell everybody um, what my problem is or how it should be worked out. Mary tucked all these things within her heart. That's got, that kind of encompasses that ability, that that which Mary is noted for, to ponder, to perceive. 
This means that she has spiritual understanding. This is what the word means. And she thought to herself, what, what might this mean? This is not a form of doubt like dear brother Zacharias who said, excuse me, angel, I'm sorry. I, I know you said my prayer was answered and that my wife who's very old is going to have a baby, but I just choose not to believe that. This is not the case with Mary. Mary is just, her mind is going. She is recalling scripture, story after story after story. It's got to be just flooding her mind, thinking, what, what, what does this all mean? It means to be amazed or surprised. In other words, she's saying, why me? Or who am I to receive such an honor? Not looking at herself of, oh, how humble I am, how, how close I am to the Lord, how well I know the word of God. Of course I expect God to choose me to be the mother of the Messiah. No. She is humbled at this whole thing. I have a qu- couple questions for us tonight. First of all, I would say to us, do you live in a city like Nazareth? A lot of violence, a lot of corruption, a lot of atrocities taking place. Mm-hmm. I would say that we could all say we live in cities like, like this. Do you live among a crooked and perverse generation? Did you know that primetime TV... That, that aired the Super Bowl, has now um, classified Miller's beer commercial and Budweiser beer commercials as porno commercials. Do we live? I don't know if any of you saw some of those commercials that were aired for the Super Bowl, but they are absolute, they're pornography. I, you can't say anything else. Stripping in front of the TV to sell beer, basically. It's, it's just, it's terrible. We live in a crooked and perverse generation. Are you like Mary asked to shine forth Jesus in a very dark place? Are you in a situation that is less than perfect? Is there not much light where you are? Maybe within your home, you're the only one that is really on fire for the Lord. What about at work? How about at school? How about among your acquaintances? Are you being asked to shine forth Jesus in the midst of a dark place? Are you like a resident of Nazareth and saying, could anything good come out of my life? Could anything good come out of what I'm experiencing right now? Is that a question that might go through your mind tonight? Are you facing something that needs a miracle and you're just having a tough time believing that God is still a God of miracles? I mean, this is something that is humanly impossible, something that you are facing a desire, a hardship. It's just humanly, as far as you're looking at all the statistics and all the facts, and you need a miracle, or it's just not going to happen. Are you in a situation that's impossible to fix? A fractured relationship? A fractured family that needs desperately divine intervention for God to come and fix what's wrong? Are you troubled? Are you troubled in the negative way? Are you saying today to the Lord, why? Why me? What? What is it that I have done to deserve what is upon me now? What? What? I am trying to serve you, and you're just sitting out there, and you're just kind of giving him his com- your complaint, and your attitude is bad, and you're just, you're just perturbed. And in the negative sense, you are troubled by what God has asked you to accept. Or is it on the other aspect, like Mary, and are you surprised? And do you stand in awe and you say, Lord, why me? Why have you chosen me for such a special assignment? Why have you given me this opportunity that is like the opportunity of a lifetime? Lord, why? I I am in awe at the things that you put before me and the opportunities that you set before me to to show your love and, and for you to use me. We look at the promise. Look at verse 30. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom There shall be no end. The message to Mary was, fear not. 
Now remember, she lived in troubled times. It was very dark, very oppressive, a lot of sadness. There was no, a lot, just not a lot of hope. A lot of hopelessness was around her. A lot of fear was in, involved with all of that. And over and over again, it seems as though the angels come and the thing that they say to mankind is fear not. It was a timely message. In other words, what he was saying to her is, there's nothing to be afraid of, Mary. What God is going to give to you to do is going to be the greatest thing that you will ever experience in life. It will be above and beyond what you could ever imagine could take place in your life. But there's nothing to be afraid of. There is no adversary too great. There is no weapon that can be formed against you that will prosper. Mary, you are in God's hands. You are tucked under his wing. There is nothing to be afraid of. It was a timely message. And I think that this is a timely message for us too. It's a timely message. When we face terrible times, we too face cities that are much like Nazareth. We face the threat of or the fear of war and and tragedy, of sickness, of terror, these kinds of things. And then there's personal trouble, the things that we might face. But in this time of fear or those things that bring fear into our lives, God is saying it is time now not to be full of fear but to be full of faith. And when the angel spoke that message to Mary, instantly the fear was dissolved because of her simple faith in God, because he is sovereign and he knows what he's doing. And he is the one that protects us. We are in his hands. So there is nothing to fear, no matter what it is that we face, no matter what our nation faces, no matter what you face, no matter what our personal troubles are. When we have faith in God, it dissolves our fear. And so God says it, the time has come not to fear, but to have faith. And not to have faith in yourself, but to have faith in God. God is saying it is time for deliverance, daughters of God. It is time for us to walk in victory. Enough of being defeated and discouraged and overwhelmed and just barely making it, just barely getting up. No, every day I wake up and I say, this is the day I will obey you, Lord. This is the day that you will empower me. I want to be empowered to do your will. It is a time of for me and for you to believe in miracles. It's time to reignite that faith once again, not in ourselves, but in God. It's time for us to put Jesus in his rightful place for him to reign in these hearts of ours. He must reign because we have a mission to accomplish. And God has a work for us to do. He has called us at this time. We are his chosen ones. Mary was the chosen one at this time, but we are in this time. And God has a, just as great a calling upon our lives as he did Mary's. But yet we have to look to him and not fear. Notice he says here, Behold, Mary, you will bring forth Jesus, verse 31. He declares that he will be great in 32. It says in verse 33 that he shall reign, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There will be no end to what God will do for that woman who will put Jesus first, that will allow him to occupy the throne of your heart. No end to what he will do, even the impossible. But he wants charge. Now, Mary did not deserve this calling. She didn't earn it. It wasn't because she was someone special or because her circumstances were perfect. They were none of that. But the reason that she received this calling and the reason that she was used of God was in verse 38, because of the fact that she accepted the plan that God had for her. It was in simple acceptance. She said, basically, do with me what you want. Verse 38 is a brief but powerful prayer. She is answering in response to what the angel said, that she would conceive the Son of God. And in response, spontaneous response, no hesitation, as soon as he stopped speaking, this is what came out of her mouth. Instant obedience, a willingness to do what God had asked her to do, even the impossible, what she couldn't even comprehend in her wildest imagination. And teenagers have wild imaginations. 
We as women have wild imaginations. And her response is, verse 38, Mary said, Behold the handmaid. The word handmaid is the female term for bond slave, douloi. Behold your douloi, Lord. I am your slave, she says. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it, be it unto me according to thy word. Now, is it possible that at this response, you often wonder, when was Jesus conceived? At what moment could it be that the moment she said yes to God's plan, Jesus was conceived? When she uttered this prayer, could it be that conception took place right then and there? Powerful thought. How powerful is a prayer such as this to one that is serious about serving the Lord and about him doing all the things that he has promised to do. He has come to set us free. He has come to deliver us from the things that hold us back. He has come to wipe away our past. Our past should have nothing to do with with us serving God today and for us growing in our faith and become stronger and mightier in the call of God upon our lives. Nothing should hold us back. The moment that we say yes to God, that empowering is there to do what he has asked us to do. All it takes is, behold, your handmaiden. Lord, I'm your slave. Do with me what you want. Her quick response reveals that she loved God more than life itself. Now, you have to understand something about the um, time in which this was written. For Mary to be found pregnant out of wedlock... It isn't like today, but she would be a possibility of being stoned to death. It was death for a woman to be pregnant out of wedlock. And then what about Joseph? You know, he could divorce her. And so she's saying here, she has no idea what's going to happen. And she's saying to the Lord, I will serve you, Lord, in life or death. In other words, she loved God more than her own life. Now, at 14, 15, 16 years old... That is a powerful statement. That is a woman who is yearning after God's will for her life. What about us? Do we have that desire? Do we have that yearning? Do we have that deep desire to be that on fire for the Lord and to really make a difference and for him to do great and mighty things in us so that he can do great and mighty things through us? This is the kind of woman that God chooses to use and work and work through. Not only that, but in her simple childlike faith, she believed that God knew what was best for her. This was a plan he had designed specifically for her. And then the great question, I love questions, you know how I am. Verse 34, I just I he doesn't leave us wondering how this happened. Because you always think, how did the Immaculate Conception take place? And I mean, we know about conception. Girls, we weren't born yesterday. We all know how the whole thing works. And so did this kid. Mary knew too. She says, now, uh, I have a question. Verse 34 says, Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? See, she knew how the whole thing worked. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, the word power is deutimus, which is another word for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that, that dynamic work that he does, making us little dynamos. The power or the deutimus of the highest shall overshadow thee. This word overshadow is like a cloud. And that speaks of this gentle, a cloud, you're not afraid of a cloud. A cloud is, you know, a cloud. I mean, it can't harm us. And so it was like an, an overshadowing, a very possible that a, some type of a cloud of some type came upon her. But it speaks of the gentle yet mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, his wonder-working power. Who can explain it? But this is how it was going to be, to be done. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Christ formed in me. That's what was taking place in Mary's life. Oh, what a mystery. How do you explain it? It's hard to explain, but yet we can kind of understand a little bit. And yet we too are called upon, or the calling of God is that Christ is formed in us. And it's a mystery. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Just as Christ was formed in Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
so he is formed in us. And Paul prayed. He labored in prayer for those um, that came to the Lord. He says, I labor in prayer till Christ be formed in you. Now, think about this. As far as a, a pregnant woman is concerned, she does not need a sign placed around her neck saying, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant. You know, it's kind of obvious when a woman becomes pregnant, especially, you know, as the stages advance. It is very obvious. She does not need to wear a sign. And these days with the clothes that they wear, it is very obvious when a woman becomes pregnant. That she kind of glows. There's something about her. She's carrying life within her. She takes on a totally different appearance when she becomes pregnant. She is stretched beyond measure. Any of those that have bore children, you just think, oh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to, I cannot possibly get any larger because it's going, I'm going to pop. You think, how does it all happen? She is stretched beyond measure. She has strange cravings or desires when this takes place at any cost. And no matter how difficult, with the infertility on the rise as it is, women go to any cost, any sacrifice to have children. And the difficulty, if it's a high-risk pregnancy, she'll go to bed for months. She'll have all kinds of procedures done to keep that baby. And even with the, the pain of labor, that horrific, horrible pain of bringing forth a child, women still have babies. It's amazing. But at the moment that baby is born, there is this joy indescribable. There is nothing greater than holding that newborn in your arms for the first time, counting the toes and the fingers and all. But what about us? How is Christ formed in us? Through our personal struggles and through our less than perfect circumstances, Christ is formed in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. What will it cost me? What sacrifices will I make in order that Jesus will be evident in me? That when people look at me, they're going to know that something is different. I am going to glow with the Shekinah glory of God. But Christ is formed in us through our struggles. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to those that love God. That together means I must cooperate with God in what he brings in my life so that I can bear forth fruit, and that fruit is Jesus. God's plan was presented to Mary, but it was Mary's choice to either accept the plan or to reject the plan. Now, Mary had no idea how exactly the Son of God was going to be conceived, how he was going to enter her womb how he was going to be formed in her. Now, conception is hard enough to understand. Even us that are, you know, intelligent, bright women, it's just a difficult thing to understand. What about the Immaculate Conception? It's very difficult. But it didn't need a great understanding. All it needed was that she believed God at his word and accepted the plan that he had for her life. In other words, she said, I want this mighty work of God in my life. I want God to do the impossible for me. Is that your heart's cry tonight? Is that where you are? Has God stirred your heart to believe in miracles, to believe in God's divine intervention? This is how he wants to work in our lives, so that we are such a testimony to the world. We are so different. Our faith is so strong, we're going to get through anything. We're going to take go through the wall. We're going to, our tree is going to hang over. There's going to be so much fruit because God is for us. And God is working on our behalf. And through the things that he takes me through, Jesus is seen better and better and bigger and bigger. And we are stretched beyond measure. But we grow in our faith and we become strong. Is that your heart's cry? That you want this mighty work of God in your life tonight? That you want him to do the impossible? And all we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I want this. I want this. But it takes that prayer to be serious. And so tonight we pray, Lord, behold your handmaidens. What do you want to do with us, Lord? That's our prayer tonight, that we offer him ourselves as his slave. And as his slave, we relinquish all rights 
to our desires, our hopes, our dreams in exchange for his. Because we honestly believe his is so far more superior than ours anyway. And that he wants to use us more than we want to be used. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to empower. All he needs is a woman to say, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. That we might say tonight, anything you say, Lord. Can we say that to him tonight? Anything you say, Lord. Yeah. But we would make it our prayer every day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Just for direction. What is the type of woman that you're looking for today? It's a woman that is not perfect. In fact, she's quite ordinary, but she's available. One that will trust you with her whole life. One that will come and say, Lord, I love you more even than life. And Lord, you will do the miraculous. And you will choose us to do the extraordinary. We don't know how it will happen, but we know it will be good and wonderful because your plan is only good and wonderful and great. And so, Lord, our prayer is, look upon us tonight. Behold your handmaidens. And, Lord, don't listen to our complaining and our murmuring because we will stomp our feet a bit when, it begins, when you begin to press in upon us. But don't listen to that, Lord. Listen to our heart's cry. Not to the Lolo, the old nature within us, but the new nature who cries out and says, Lord, I want you to do great and mighty things for me. I want your will in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.